That's true. Naked Palpatine. Um. <laughs> oh, oh, you think that one? Fresh out of the clone tank, nude Palpatine is my That's well, the first thing I think of when you say Dark Empire Palpatine. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Star Wars Expanded Universe. Now by Disney, Oregon Lucasfilm, whichever way you slice it, <laughs> Legends. Today, after you, I don't have the physical copy. It's someone I don't have a physical copy for. I have a physical copy for the rest of them. But I have my Kindle version. Um, Legacy of the Force, Book 5, Sacrifice by Karen Travis. Um... So it's a big one, another big one that makes people drop off if they didn't already. Um, I think it's great. I, I again, I continue to think that Karen Travis just just nails it, nails the tone, nails the themes, um, nails the character moments. She's very much a character first person, which I think is part of the reason people you know kind of rag on her Republic Commando books because they're very character focused, less than than plot focused and. You know, that tends to rub some people the wrong way, especially with how hard she hammers into a lot of that. It tends to become sort of fan fiction-y. Um, but here I think it works. It works quite well. Um, I think she writes all the characters really well, you know? And I, you know, I, I continue to say there, you know, um, um, the Boba Fett side of things, um, before my, 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 my defense was that it was relevant to the story, um, for the grander story of the of the EU, in terms of Boba Fett being able to continue to do stuff, it does matter because he finds a cure uh, in this book, so he can live for like at least another thirty years or so. You know, whether he'll be actually a bounty hunter in the next twenty is or, or even ten is debatable, but he at least has thirty years worth of life left to maybe you know live out the last fifteen or twenty years of an old person life as just an old person living on Mandalore or whatever, though at the end of this series it doesn't seem like that's really possible, but we'll get to that and when we get to the end of the series. But um, it is very disconnected, you know, in terms of this plot. It, for the grand scheme of the EU, it makes it so Boba Fett can still be around in future stories and whatnot, but, you know, it, it is just Murtagev, some some clones and some characters from Public Commando and Boba Fett, you know, and then he finally finds a cure and is cured of, of his problems. And that, that that's basically it for his story. And, all, I mean, I'll say it's written well, and I enjoy it. But ultimately, as for this plot in particular, it ha doesn't really have anything to do with it. And it does kind of hinder the pacing of the actual plot, of the main plot that we're here for, which is everything with Jason and Lamaya and Mar Jade and everything else within the story. So it just kind of put that to a halt. Um, so I, I will say that is... Um, objectively a problem um, just in terms of pacing because it kind of ruins the pacing the story itself is fine and I, I think it's actually pretty good um, even though it's pretty disconnected you know and, and again to play devil's advocate you know there, there's people who love the Lando stuff and Black Fleet Crisis even though it's mostly irrelevant to the main plot so I, I would argue the same thing here um, but it, it is it is a problem structurally um, and narratively because it just kind of like you're invested in this, and then it stops you to listen to Mandalorian stuff. Now, if you're into that, like I am, it's okay. But if you're not really a big fan of that, and you want to focus on the main story, whereas the last book, Bloodlines, Ben Karen Travis, it felt more integrated with the main plot, this doesn't as much, so it feels a bit like a side story. Um, and so it, it, it kind of ruins the pacing. So that is an objectively negative thing about it. Um, I think the Mandalorian stuff and Boba Fett and everything is good, though. It just... Um, it ruins the flow. It won't ruin it as much in uh, Revelations um, because it will be plot relevant, but here it is purely just a side story, basically. So for that, it does get some negative points. Outside of that, we have Jason continuing trying to pick Ben as his apprentice uh, of the Sith, even though uh, Jason has not embraced the Sith role yet. Um, and so he keeps putting him on missions and getting him to do stuff for him that might bring him further. But it doesn't because Ben's awesome. Um, Lumaya is getting tired of everything. The political crisis with Corellia and uh, the Galactic Alliance and the other factions continues to, to boil over. And, you know, um, 
stuff will happen near the end of this book where Jason will finally accept his mantle as Sith Lord completely and utterly and will dub himself by the end of this novel Darth Kytus. So we will be referring to Jason from here on out after book five, book six, seven, and eight. He will be Kytus, not Jason. Not until we get to um, book nine where he may return at the end. Though there's a lot of nuance in Karen Travis's next book where you can kind of debate whether or not that's fully Kytus, 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 whatever, or if that's Jason uh, simmering through. Um, but yeah, um, again, we're, we're five books in. Um, there's a controversial choice made here. Um, I think it works well. I think it, it adds to the story. I think it brings real stakes. I think it wasn't done carelessly or, or, or needlessly or without reverence. I think it was done with the utmost respect uh, and, and care. Um, you know, outside of the fact that they didn't um, tell a certain author about this decision, which was really a bad move on their part. Um, I, I think overall how it all worked out was really well done, really respectful, and just well done. Um, there is an interview on the back of Sacrifice where um, Travis says that she she chose this, but it seems like, because earlier on in that same um panel or whatever they were talking about how they promised they would never address who did it and then Karen Travis said I did it because everybody hates the Brits already um, and I think that was a bit of a joke you know you can't really tell with the tone because it's a text but I, I think it's very clear from the text itself that that was meant to be a joke and we don't actually know who truly did it um, but yeah it, if you hate this era this isn't going to change your mind you know and I've, I've said my piece time and again kind of getting tired of it so I'm not going to, like, constantly defend myself. Like, I'm just right and you're just wrong. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But ultimately, you know, it is what it is. You like it, you don't like it. Um, if you have been liking this series, this still might upset you quite a bit. Um, and that's understandable. It's a very big thing that happens near the end of this book. The only big thing that really happens in this series, um, because, you know, NGO was the big, oh my god. Um, but this has been a pretty small-scale series. This is the only big, big uh, repercussion thing that kind of happens in this series um, but I think it was executed well um, and the story continues to be wonderfully crafted and, and wonderfully nuanced and everything and I've again I've really enjoyed the storytelling and um, Jason tries to get more um, political in this book you know a bit more play more a bit more of that pop team where he you know changes laws and does these things to you know plays within the system to actually get what he wants because it's you know fairly easy which I can also imagine being some upsetting to people if you believe in the system of law or anything like that but I haven't really believed in that stuff for a good long while so it doesn't bug me that much um, but yeah I, I'm trying to talk about what I can talk about looking into spoilers but um, that's you know Ben gets put on an assassination mission Jason's furthering his descent but being unable to find a sacrifice worthy to make him a full Sith Lamaya is trying to encourage him. Um, ben, or sorry, uh, Mara and Jason, uh, Luke, I'm sorry, are basically convinced at this point, you know, that Jason is uh, maybe not a Sith Lord, but he's bad. But Mara d d takes things on her own to, to find out about Lumaya, only to realize that Jason is indeed um, working with Lumaya, and he's not being controlled, he's not being mind controlled, and she decides to take care of business herself. And that's basically non spoiler wise what I can mention uh, in, in Sacrifice. I really like this book. It's one of my favorites. Um, again, I think it works, uh, and I think it works well, and I do recommend it, and I hope you check it out sometime. Um, I'm going to get into spoilers. If you don't want spoilers, then you should leave. Okay, so we got... Um, we start with the state of Mandalore after the Vong War, which was cool to, to hear about because, again, the Mandalorians were helping during the Vong War and we just knew nothing about it. So it was interesting to hear the state of Mandalore after that. Right now, the you know the Galactic Alliance is basically controlled by uh, Kalomas, Jason Solo, and uh, Cha Nathal. Um, so it's an interesting dynamic. They all play with one another. Uh, Murta and Boba... You know, even though the, the story is basically completely separate, they continue to have phenomenal chemistry. And I really, really enjoy um, their interactions. 
Um, Jason's further descent. You know, again, at, at this point, he, like, hates, like, Luke. You know, and people find that to be a contradiction because he, you know, he started this mission to save Luke and look where he's at now. But I, I, I think that's kind of the point. You know, I, I think it, it's the dark side does corrupt, which is funny because I think Troy Denning is of the same opinion as everyone else that, you know, of the unifying force that the dark side doesn't corrupt, that it's not an actual thing that can happen. But I think the story well enough works in that way, though, that it is something that corrupts you, that changes you, or even if you want to take it more literal, that power corrupts. But I do think the Force, especially the dark side of the Force, is a real tangible thing, and it does affect your, your mindset and how you view things and how you deal with things. Um, and so he starts out book one one way, and he starts out, and he ends up at the end of this a different way. But there's still light in him, and he refuses to go all out to become the full Dark Lord of the Sith that he's supposed to be. Um, and so there's a little bit of shreds of humanity left. So he isn't completely and utterly committed. But the descent has been noticeable and it's becoming much larger because he basically, for all intents and purposes, doesn't really care about anyone anymore except for his mission outside of Ben and his family, Alana and Tino Ka. And, you know, he actively hates Luke now, thinks that Luke is arrogant and annoying and frustrating. You know, doesn't necessarily want him dead, but it's going to probably come to that, and he's sick of it with him. And, you know, again, this is because the dark side is corrupting him and he's becoming a Sith, though he's not fully committed yet. But I just like the the subtle and slow descent that we've seen from the first book to now. Like, it wasn't a one and done. This has been a very gradual process, you know, and the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I, I think it works really well. And, um, yeah, I, I don't think it's just out of nowhere. Mara and Luke have a debate with Ben about the Empire. Because, you know, Ben's been with the Galactic Alliance. He's really grown into a man far too early for his age. And he talks about, you know, was the Empire completely evil? Do, 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 do. What right do you have to do this and that? It was just a very interesting discussion between the three of them. Um, and Jason asks Ben to assassinate Gargajan. Gargajan, the... Uh, the, the, the whatever it's called, the prime minister of Corelli at this time, who did who did actively send out assassins to kill Tino Khan Alana in the third book. So this this is like not a good dude, but he asked Ben to do it of all people because he wants Ben to go to the dark side. And Jason feels so conflicted because either uh, Ben becomes his apprentice or he feels like Ben's going to be the sacrifice because he truly and utterly loves Ben. You know, he, he sees Ben as, like, a, a son slash little brother, you know, that he lost. And he doesn't want to harm Ben, but it seems like it's pointing to that. But he, So he sends Ben on this mission. And Ben does. He successfully headshots the Prime Minister, who was not fighting back. And the whole section with Ben, dealing with the grief of that, was phenomenal. And Lakoff sacrifices himself so that way Shavu and him can get away. And all that was just utterly brilliant and incredible. And, and it makes him get closer to Mara, because Mara used to do that kind of work. And people seem to think this is a bit contradictory for Mara, but it, it's what she used to do. And it really helps uh, form that bond between uh, him and his mother. Jason also, through legal means, captures Omas and makes him a political prisoner. Uh, because he was going to try to talk some peace talk with uh, Gergesian. But, you know, talking with a, a warring faction um, under the radar, you know, not officially, is paramount to treason, legally speaking anyway. So they take advantage of that. Um, ben, you know, ends up hearing... I mean, here's the thing. People also say this is stupid that Jason would just freely talk in his office. You know, as if, you know... Uh, Somebody could be tapping in and listening, but obviously Jason's smart enough to know that. And he's like one of the strongest force sensitives in this entire setting. Like outside of Luke, he's probably the strongest. Now we'll get into a certain thing that happens near the end, but Jason is by all means one of the strongest beings in the entire galaxy, especially with the force. So if he, he would sense if somebody was coming by, but he taught Ben how to hide himself in the force and he's been getting better at it, you know? So... Yeah, normally I'd say, yeah, you're right, he's stupid, but it, he's not stupid. He knows exactly, you know, who's there, who isn't there, usually. He would know if he was being tapped, he would know if he was being bugged, he would know if someone was listening in the hallway because he would sense them in the force. So he knows when he can and can't talk to people. The fact is, Ben was hiding himself in the force like Jason had taught him. So Jason couldn't sense him. He was like a Vong. And so Ben 
could overhear him talking to Lamaya. And I, I don't, I don't see that as Jason being stupid, you know. I think that just makes sense. Um, but yeah, so here's uh, Jason talking to Lamaya, more as like a peer than someone being like possessed or mind controlled. And so he takes that as, oh no. And so who does he go to? He goes to his mother about it, and Ben tells Mara what's going on. And Mara is set on killing Jason. Um, and then also, going back to the Boba plot, again, around this time, Boba Fett finds a cure. So he's now not going to die next year. So that's important. So that way, for the wider scheme of the universe, he could be around in future stories. But yeah, he's not going to die now. He's fine. Uh, he'll die of old age, but he won't die of this disease. Or the rapid aging cloning stuff. Uh, and then the most controversial part of the book, we have Mara versus Jason. So Jason and Mara have this huge duel. Because um, she goes to confront him and goes to kill him. And it's a really egregious fight. Like, a lot of blood, a lot of violence. And I would say, arguably, and almost definitively, that Jason is the strongest fighter here. Or the strongest force user, but maybe not the best fighter. Because he was never much of a martial artist or anything. Um, and the way that Mara... Because I feel like Mara, in just pure, pure force power, would get curb stomped by Jason. But this was in close quarters combat with a lot of tight spaces. So it was more about your fighting ability than anything else. And so it was very neck and neck, very violent. You know, Mara's attacking like she's getting her due. She's showing how awesome and amazing and grand that she is. The wife of Luke Skywalker, one of the most powerful Jedi of this era, going to toe to toe with Jason Solo, who's the other most powerful being in this setting outside of Luke. And they're duking it out. And she's getting so many hits in. And she's doing great. She's doing great. He's also doing pretty good at avoiding her. But she's relentless. She's driven. She's a mother. She's a bear. She's going to stop him from causing any problems for Ben. And, you know, um, it's a little contrived, sure, but he just needs a split second of hesitation. He makes an image of Ben real quick that makes Mara, you know, just tense up for like, just like a split of a second, maybe two seconds at most. You know, like, to the human eye, it would be so fast to be able to notice, but it was enough for Jason to poison her and kill her. So Mara Jade Skywalker, who... You know, we know now because of the Thrawn trilogy was going to kill Luke Skywalker uh, during Episode Six, and who was, you know, Palpatine's like assassin slash scalpel. Whereas if Vader was the hammer, Mara Jade was the scalpel, and she, you know, did stuff throughout the Rebellion era. You know, then she met Luke in the Thrawn trilogy. She went off and did her own thing for a bit, became a Jedi. Da 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 da. Went back to smuggling for a bit. Da, 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 married Luke, fought in the Vong War, had a kid, and now we're here. And she lived a long and eventful life, and it was amazing and fantastic and great, but she dies here. And I think it was done superbly well. I think it was done with grace, I think it was done with nuance, and I think it was a good choice to do. Um... But Luke believes that it was Maya who killed Mara. And so Luke... In, hold on. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, so... Luke thinks that uh, Maya did it. So we get this epic scene. Where they're gonna fight. And you think it's gonna be this epic fight. Because last time... It was a pretty good fight, but... Luke was holding back. He was holding back a lot. That's what he tends to do. He's basically the Superman of this universe. At this point, anyway. He is so overpowered, you know. No one can touch him except for godlike figures that we'll meet in the next big series. And even then, he kind of sizes them down because they didn't do a good job with that villain of making them intimidating. But we'll get to that. But, um... You think it's gonna be a duel? There is no duel. He easily stops her. She's going to fall to her death. And he promises, I'll never let you fall. And he slices her head off. Leaves coldly. And you're most certain he did tap into the dark side. And that's going to terrify Luke. Which is very important for the finale to this series. But... He feels horrible 
because regardless of what Lamaya has done, she wasn't guilty of killing his wife. He doesn't know who did it, but Ben assures him it wasn't Lamaya because he was he saw Lamaya earlier. But now lamaya has gone, and Jason is ascended because we learn sacrifice, which is again controversial, but. Ben's love for Jason is the sacrifice. I still think it works. Do I think it would have been better if it was Tino Ka? Probably. I think that would have made more sense. This does add multiple layers for why Mara makes more sense, emotionally and plot-wise. Mara had a special relationship with Jason. It was vaguely shown in NGO, but it was really shown in Dark Nest. And it was shown in the first couple books of Legacy of the Four. She felt a kinship and appreciation for Jason and what he had done for her son. And he'd always liked Mara. He never hated Mara. As he turned to the dark side, he started to hate Luke. But he never really hated Mara. He was different to her. He saw her as an obstacle. But he didn't hate her. And then she comes after him. But what's the one thing that's been consistent, no matter how far he's fallen, what has remained true? That he cares deeply and utterly for Ben. Whether as a son he never had, or as a brother that he lost. Whatever the case, he cares for Ben. And the fear of having to kill him to rise to his Sith position terrified him. Constantly made him push it away. In fact, he even said that the Maya speculated that whenever things would get too hectic, Jason would spend like an hour alone in his office by himself meditating. And he's supposed to be furthering down the dark side, but it would always kind of rekindle a candle in his heart. You know, this little light would spring back up. And she needed that quenched. But he'd always find ways to kind of like not go all the way. So he really didn't want to kill Ben. But then Mara left him no choice and he had to kill Mara. In an instant he felt like it was right, but he didn't understand how. It didn't make sense because he liked Mara, but he didn't love her deeply where he'd feel such pain if he lost her. But he knew it was a pivotal moment. And then it just kind of clicked for him. Someday, Ben will realize that I killed his mother. And because... Because of that, Ben would always immortalize his mother as something positive. You know, think about if you have a positive relationship with a parental figure. You know, you if they die, you tend to think of them in a positive light in, in reminiscing. You don't tend to think about any of the arguments or stupid things you might have dealt with. So, whenever Ben will think of his mother, he'll think about positive thoughts of, of her. And when the enemy associates her death with Jason, once Ben knows that, he will never, ever be able to love ben, uh, Jason again. And so Jason's sacrifice is to lose the love of Ben. The one person outside of his wife, or lover and daughter, that he truly, deeply, and utterly cares for. No matter what changes, no matter whether he's a dark sider or not. You know, dark nest to here. The one consistent thing is his love for those three that has never changed, no matter how far he's fallen. But now, he has to give that up in order to take on his Sith mantle. And of course, Darth Kytus, there's no real reasoning given in the novels for why he chose that name. Uh, the external explanation is that, and it was something cool to do for fans that of the books, was they did... Um, this contest, and the winner gets to choose the name of the new Sith Lord name. So they chose Darth Kytus. So now we have Darth Kytus. Um, and we'll see what Darth Kytus gets into in the next four books. But that's pretty much it. Overall, I think it's fantastic. Um, if you don't like the Mandalorian stuff, you're probably going to find that very boring. But overall, I think it was a good choice. I think it hits the emotional beats it needs to. I don't think it was done needlessly. I think it was done with purpose. Uh, and, and it was done with respect. And, you know, again, 
Luke murder someone. So now when he learns it's Jason, he's going to be terrified. But if he faces Jason, he will probably turn to the dark side. And he will be a worse threat than Jason ever was. Just like Yoda talks about in Yoda Dark Rendezvous. You better hope and pray I never turn to the dark side. Because I'd be terrifying. And so would Luke. So this is going to make Luke rather hesitate in the books to come. And it will be up to someone else to defeat the villain. Who is that? We'll have to keep reading to find out. Next time, we have Inferno by Troy Denning. Till then, guys. May the Force be with you.